Hey, and welcome to episode 39 of the Chronicles of Narnia series, Persona God of War 20 Story Time. We're now at the book three, The Horse and His Boy, chapter seven, Aravis in Tashban. What had really happened was this. When Aravis saw Shasta hurried away by the Narnians and found himself alone with two horses who very wisely wouldn't say a word, she never lost her head even for a moment. She grabbed Bree's halter and stood still, holding both the horses, and though her heart was beating as hard as a hammer, she did nothing to show it. As soon as the Narnian lords had passed, she tried to move on again. But before she could take a step, another crier, Bother all these people, thought Aravis, was heard shouting about, so Aravis, yeah, was heard shouting about, way, 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 way for the Tarkina, Lazraline, and immediately following the crier came four armed slaves and then four bearers bear, carrying a litter which was all a flutter with silken curtains and all a jingle with silver bells which scented the whole street with perfumes and flowers after the litter female slaves in beautiful clothes and then a beautiful groom's runners pages and then a few and then a few grooms runners pages and the like and now aravis made her first mistake she knew lazraline quite well almost as if they had been at school together because they had often stayed in the same houses and been to the same parties and aravis couldn't help looking up to see what lazraline looked like now that she was married and a very great person indeed. It was fatal. The eyes of the two girls met, and immediately Lazraline sat up, sat up in the litter and burst out at the top of her voice, Aravis! What on earth are you doing here? Your father! There was not a moment to lose. Without a... Seconds delay, Aravis let go the horses, caught the edge of the litter, swung herself up beside Lazraline, and whispered furiously in her ear, Shut up, do you hear? Shut up! You must hide me, tell your people. But darling, began Lazraline, in the same loud voice. She didn't in the least mind making people stare. In fact, she rather liked it. Do what I tell you, or I'll never speak to you again, hissed Aravis. Please, please, be quick, lass. It's frightfully important. Tell your people to bring those two horses along. Put all the curtains of the litter. And get away. Now, pull all those curtains of the litter and get away. Somewhere where I can't be found. And do hurry. All right, darling said Lazraline in her lazy voice. So, all right, darling, said Lazraline in her lazy voice. Here, two of you take the Tarkina's horses. This was to the slaves. And now home, I say, darling. Do you think we really want the curtains drawn on a day like this? I mean to say, but Aravis had already drawn the curtains, enclosing Lazraline and herself, in a rich and scented, but rather scu but rather stuffy kind of tent. I mustn't be seen, she said. My father doesn't know I'm here. I'm running away. My dear, how perfectly thrilling, said Lazraline. I'm dying to hear all about it. 
Darling, you're sitting on my dress. Do you mind? That's better. It is a new one. Do you like it? I got it at... Oh, lads, do be serious, said Aravis. Where is my father? Didn't you know, said Lazarine. He's here, of course. He came to town yesterday and is asking about you everywhere. And to think of you and me being here together, and his not knowing anything about it. It's the funniest thing I've ever heard. And she went off in giggles. She always had been a terrible giggler, as Aravis knew, as Aravis now remembered. It isn't funny at all, she said. It's dreadfully serious. Where can you hide me? No difficulty at all, my dear girl, said Lazarine. I'll take you home. My husband's away and no one will see you. Phew! It's not much fun with the curtains drawn. I want to see people. There's no point in having a new dress if one's, if one's to go about shut up like this. I hope no one heard you when you shouted out to me like that, said Aravis. No, no, of course, darling, said Lazarine, absent-mindedly. But you haven't even told me yet what you think of the dress. Another thing, said Aravis. You must tell people to treat those two horses very respectfully. That's part of the secret. They're usually talking horses from Narnia. Fancy, said Lazarine. How exciting! And oh, darling, have you seen the barbarian queen from Narnia? She's staying in Tashban at present. They say Prince Rabadash is madly in love with her. There have been the most wonderful parties and hunts and things all this last fortnight. I can't see that she's so pretty. I can't see that she's so pretty myself. But some of the Narnian men are lovely. I was taken out on a river party the day before yesterday. And I was wearing my... How shall we present your people telling you ev... T sorry. How shall we prevent your people telling everyone that you've got a visitor? Dressed like a beggar's brat. In your house. It might be so easy to... It might so easily get around to my father. Now don't keep on fussing, there's a dear, said Lazarine. We'll get you some proper clothes in a moment. And here we are. The bearers had stopped at the litter, and the litter was being lowered. When the curtains had been drawn, Aravis found that she was in a courtyard garden, very like the one that Shasta had been taken to a few minutes earlier, in another part of the city. Lazarine would have gone indoors at once, but Aravis reminded her in, in a frantic whisper, to say something to the slaves about not telling anyone of, of her mistress's strange visitor. Sorry, darling, it had gone right out of my head, said Lazarine. Here, all of you, and you, doorkeeper, no one is to be let out of the house today. And anyone I catch talking about this young lady will be first beaten to death and then burned alive after that. Be kept on bread and water for six weeks there. Although Lazarine had said she was dying to hear Aravis's story, she showed no sign of really wanting to hear it at all. She was, in fact, much better at talking and, than at listening. She insisted on Aravis having a long and luxurious bath. Calamine baths are famous. And then dressing her up in the finest clothes before she would let her explain anything. The fuss was made about choosing the dresses nearly drove... Sorry, the fuss about choosing the dresses nearly drove Aravis mad. She remembered now that Lazarine had always been like that, 
interested in clothes and parties and gossip. Aravis had always been more interested in, bow in bows and arrows and horses and dogs and swimming. You will guess that each thought the other silly. But when at last they were both seated after a meal, it was chiefly of the whipped cream and jelly and fruit and ice sort in a beautiful pillared room, which Aravis would have liked better if Lazarine's spoiled pet monkey hadn't been climbing about it all the time. Lazarine at last asked her why she was running away from home. When Aravis had finished telling her story, Lazarine said, But darling, why don't you marry a, to a hosh to Tarkan? Everyone's crazy about him. My husband says he is beginning yet he is beginning to be one of the greatest men in Kalorman. He has just been made Grand Vizier and now old Axart Azar Axartha has died. Didn't you know? I don't care. I can't stand the sight of him, said Aravis. But darling, only think. Three palaces and one of them, that beautiful one down the lake, at Ilkin and Ilkeen, positively ropes the pearls. I'm told baths of, baths of arses milk. And you see such a lot of me. He can keep his pearls and palaces as far as I'm concerned, said Aravis. You always were a queer girl, Aravis, said Lazarine. What more do you want? In the end, however, Aravis managed to make her friend believe that she was in earnest, and even to discuss plans. There would be no difficulty now about getting the two horses out of the north gate, and then, and then on to the tombs. No one would stop or question a groom in fine clothes, leading a war horse and a lady saddle horse down to the river, and Lazarine had plenty of grooms to send. It wasn't so. It wasn't so easy to decide, to decide what to do about Aravis herself. She suggested that she could be carried out in the litter, with the curtains drawn. But Lazarine told her that litters were only used in the city, and the sight of one going through the gate would be certain to lead to questions. When they had talked for a long time, and it was all the longer because Aravis found it hard to keep her friend to the point, at last Lazarine clapped her hands and said, Oh, I have an idea. There is one way of getting out of the city without using the gates. The Tisrock's garden, may he live forever, runs right down to the water where there is a little water door. Only for the palace people, of course. But then you know, dear, here she tittered a little, we must almost, we, we almost are palace people. I say it is lucky for you that you came to me. The dear Tisrock, may he live forever, is so kind. We're asked to, we're asked to the palace almost every day, and it is like a second home. I love all the dear princes and princesses. And I positively adore Prince Rabadash. I might run in and see if any of the palace ladies at any hour of the day or night. Why shouldn't I slip in with you after dark and let you out by the water door? There are always a few punts and things tied up outside it, and even if we even if we were caught. All would be lost, said Aravis. Oh, darling, don't get so excited, said Lazarine. I was going to say, even if we were caught, everyone would only say it was one of my mad jokes. I'm...
getting quite well known for them. Only the other day. Do listen, dear. This was this is frightfully funny. I mean, all would be lost for me, said Aravis, a little sharply. Oh, ah, yes. I do see what you mean, darling. Well, can you think of any better plan? Aravis couldn't, and answered, No. We'll have to risk it. When can we start? Oh, not tonight, said Lazareline. Of course not tonight. There's a great feast on tonight. I must start getting my hair done for it in a few minutes. And the whole pa and the whole place will be a blaze of lights. And such a crowd, too. It would have to be tomorrow night. This was bad news for Aravis. But she had to make the best of it. The afternoon passed very slowly, and it was a relief when Lazreline went out to the banquet, for Aravis was very tired of her giggling and her talk about dresses and parties, weddings and engagements and scandals. She went to bed early, and that part she did enjoy. It was so nice to have pillows and sheets again, but the next day passed very slowly. Lazareline wanted to go back on the whole arrangement, and kept on telling Aravis that Narnia was a country of perpetual snow and ice inhabited by demons and sorcerers, and she was mad to think of going there. And with a peasant boy too, said Lazareline. Darling, think of it. It's not nice. Aravis had thought of it a good deal. But she was so tired of Lazareline's silliness by now that, for the first time, she began to think that travelling with Shasta was really rather more fun than fashionable life in Tashban. So she only replied, You forget that I'll be nobody just like him. When we get to Narnia, and anyway, I promised. And to think, said Lazareline almost crying, that if only you had sense you could be the wife of the great vizier. Aravis went away to have a private word with the horses. You must go with the groom a little before sunset down to the tomb, she said. No more of these, no more of those packs. You'll be saddled and bridled again, but There will have to be food in Huynh's saddle bags and a full water skin behind yours, Bree. The man has orders to let you both have a good long drink at the far side of the bridge. And then, Narnia in the north, whispered Bree. But what if Shasta is not of the tombs? Wait for him, of course, said Aravis. I hope you've been quite comfortable. Never been stable better in my life, said Bree. But if the husband of that tittering Tarkina friend of yours is paying his head, his head groom to get the best oats, then I think the head groom is cheering, is cheating him. Aravis and Lazareline had supper in the pillared room. About two hours later, they were ready to start. Aravis was dressed to look like a superior slave girl, and in a in in a great house, and wore a veil over her face. They had agreed that if any questions were asked, Lazareline would pretend that Aravis was a slave. She was taking as a present to one of the princesses. The two girls went on foot. A very and very few minutes brought them to the palace gates. A very few minutes brought them to the palace gates. Here there were of course soldiers on guard, but the officer knew Lazareline quite well and called his men to attention and saluted. They passed out once into the hall of black marble. A fair number of courtiers, slaves and others were still moving about here, but this only made the two girls less conspicuous. They passed on into the Hall of Pillars, 
and then into the hall of uh, statues and down the colonnade passing the great beaten copper doors to the throat of the throne room it was all magnificent beyond description what they could see of it in the dim light of the lamps presently they came out into the garden court which sloped downhill in a number of terraces on the far side of that they came to the old palace it had already grown almost dark and they now found themselves in a maze of corridors lit only by occasional torches in fixed in brackets to the walls Lazareline halted at the place where you had to go either left or right. Go on, do go on, whispered Aravis, whose heart was beating terribly and who still felt that her father might run into them at any corner. I'm just wondering, said Lazareline. I'm not absolutely sure why we go, where we go, which way we go from here. I think it's the left. Yes, I'm almost sure it's the left. What fun this is. They took the left hand way and found themselves in a passage that was hardly lighted at all and which soon began going down steps. It's all right, said Lazareline. I'm sure we're right. I'm sure we're right now. I remember these steps. But at that, moment a moving light appeared ahead a second later there appeared from around a distant corner the dark shapes of two men walking backwards and carrying tall candles and of course it is only before royalties that people walk backwards aravis felt lazareline grip her arm that sort of sudden grip which is almost a pinch and which means that the person who is gripping you is very frightened indeed. Aravis thought it odd that Lazareline should be so afraid of the Tisrock, if he were really such a friend of hers. But there was no time to go on thinking. Lazareline was hurrying her back to the top of the steps on tiptoe, and groping wildly along the wall. Here's a door, she whispered. Quick! They went in, drew the door very softly behind them, and found themselves in pitch darkness. Aravis could hear by Lazareline's breathing that she was terrified. Tash preserve us, whispered Lazareline. What shall we do if he comes in here? Can we hide? There was a soft carpet under their feet. They groped forward into the room and blundered on to a sofa. Let's lie down behind it, whimpered Lazareline. Oh, I do wish we hadn't come. There was just room between the sofa and the curtain wall, and the two girls got down. Lazareline managed to get the better position and was completely covered. The upper part of Aravis's face stuck out beyond the sofa, so that if anyone came into that room with a light and happened to look in exactly the right place, they would see her. But of course, because she was wearing a veil, what they saw would at once look like a forehead and a pair of eyes. Aravis shoved desperately to try and make Lazareline give her a little more room, but Lazareline, now quite selfish in her panic, fought back and pinched her feet. They gave it up and lay still, panting a little. Their own breath seemed dreadfully noisy, but there were no but there was no other noise. Is it safe? said Aravis. At last, in the tiniest possible whisper, I, I think so, began Lazareline. But my poor nerves. And then came the most terrible noise they could have heard at that moment. The noise of the door opening. And then came light. 
and because Aravis couldn't get her head any further in behind the sofa, she saw everything. First came the two slaves, deaf and dumb, as Aravis rightly guessed, and therefore used at the most secret councils, walking backwards and carrying the candles. They took up their stand, one at each end of the sofa. This was a good thing, for of Of course, it was now harder for anyone to see Aravis once a slave was in front of her, and she was looking between his, he his heels. Then came an old man, very fat, wearing a curious pointed cap, by which she immediately knew that he was the Tisrock. The least of the jewels with which he was covered was worth more than all the clothes and weapons of the Narnian lords put together. But he was so fat, and such a mass of frills, and pleats, and bobbles, that buttons and tassels, and talis and buttons and tassels and talismans, that Aravis couldn't help thinking the Narnian fashions, at any rate for men, look nicer. After him came a tall young man with a feathered and jewelled turban on his head and an ivory sheathed scimitar at his side. He seemed very excited and his eyes and teeth flashed fiercely in the candlelight. Last of all came a little humpbacked wizened old man in whom she recognised with a shudder, the Grand Vizier, and her own betrothed husband, Ahoshta, Tarkhan himself. As soon as all three had entered the room, the door was shut, and the Tisrock seated himself on the divan. With a sigh of contentment, the young man took his place standing before him, and the Grand Vizier, got down on his knees and elbows, and laid his face flat on the carpet. And that was chapter 7 of The Horse and His Boy. Coming up next, chapter 8, In the House of the Tisrock. Until then, bye now.